This week's video covers some of the concepts discussed in Chapter 4, Loops and Arrays. If you uh, take a look at the beginning of the chapter, they explain that like the if-then-else statements and the select case statements that you read about in Chapter 3, loops are a way of controlling your program's ex execution, which allow you to uh, repeatedly iterate over the same code, uh, perhaps passing in different variables or looking at a collection of data. So for loops, do loops, and other types of loops are an important programming structure that you would use in any programming language. An important tip on page 102, which states that if you find your program stuck in an infinite loop, to use control alt break to suspend the program execution. You can get stuck in a loop and end up uh, cycling through it infinitely, uh, which is oftentimes what causes programs to freeze up or stop responding. Uh, if you're in VB, you can use control break or control alt break to stop execution of the program. I'll show you a quick example of that here. Uh, the other thing that this project's a good example of is command buttons. These command buttons are just another type of control that you can insert. You can draw these buttons anywhere. When you double click on them, you go to the buttons click event and you can enter whichever code you want. Uh, in this case, the first command button on that page calls a program called Endless Loop. So Endless Loop is in this module. And if we look here, it dimensions a variable, which is an integer called int counter and it increases that variable int counter by one each time this loop executes. It'll then provide a message box showing us what the value of int counter is and it says loop until one equals two. Well, one never equals two so this is going to continue to loop infinitely. Um, not really infinitely since the max value of an integer uh, you may have noted earlier in the book is 32767, but that would still take a very long time and it's essentially infinite. Uh, you may get an overflow error or some other type of error if you end up clicking 32,767 times. But in this case, we're going to use the tip we just learned, control break, to stop this program from executing. So if I click command button one, exit design mode, we see one, two, three, this will keep counting up. There's no way to really stop it or close it. So if I hit control break, it says code execution has been interrupted. I can now either hit N to stop it, or I can go debug to see where it is in the code. If I go into the code and look, I see them on this loop until one equals two. That's never going to be true, so it's gonna to continue to execute the loop. You can see this int counter is 11, but it will be 11 plus 1 or 12 the next time the loop iterates. I think the recommendations on page 127 are very useful when it comes to recording macros. Uh, this is something that's built into Microsoft Office that you wouldn't necessarily get with another programming language. If you ever end up using VBA in the future, it'll probably be with macros because rather than just starting from scratch writing code, you can go ahead and record some things get it to write some code for you and then just simply modify uh, what it's done. So for example, if I start here and type A, B, C, D, E, F, G, put some other things down here, format the background, make this text bold and red. Let's say I had to do that every day. One thing you could do is record a macro to do the same thing. So if I just simply hit record macro, I'll call it macro3 and I'll store it in this workbook. I can now type some things here. A, B, C, D. One, two, three. Make this red. Bold. And we'll make these columns a little smaller. We'll make this one a little bigger. Make this row a little wider. We'll stop the recording. We'll go to our VB IDE. Now we see we have a module here where it recorded macro 3. So all the code is here to redo what we just did. 
So I can go ahead and go to a blank sheet now. Go to macros. Here's the macro I just recorded. I can run it and it'll do all the same things that we just did there. If I want to see how that macro actually works and possibly modify it, I can go ahead and put a breakpoint in. And rather than going and running the macro, I can just hit run right here. And now we can step through it one line at a time. At any point we can look and see that it's actually starting to fill in those values. We could put other breakpoints and hit play. Uh, you can step in, step out, run to the cursor. You could also put a watch on certain variables and you'll see uh, more about this later in the book or if you're interested in looking into it now you could always go to Excel's help. There are a lot of interesting things you can do under the debug menu that really help you uh, debug and solve problems that you might have with your program. In this case I'm just going to go ahead and hit a F5 or play to continue running through the program. When I go back now I have a, a fourth sheet that had the same macro run on it. So what I've created here is something that uh, I could use if I had a class with 12 students and I had some questions and nobody wanted to answer them. I wouldn't want to pick on any particular student, so I'd want the computer to just randomly select the student for me. So each time I hit the randomly select student button, a different student is selected randomly from the list. So if we take a look at how this program was written, button is clicked, we declare some variables, then select the range A1 to B12. I get rid of the background pattern and the background color. I then have a variable called int my selection, which I dimensioned up here. It's going to generate a random value between 1 and 12. I'm sorry, between 1 and, yeah, between 1 and 12. Comments outdated there. then going to select a range based on that random number that's generated. Once it selects that range, it's going to turn the background color to yellow. And the way I got this with statement, and I think we'll cover these uh, also later in the book, but in this case we haven't covered that yet. So you may be wondering how I knew uh, what to put here. The answer is I simply highlighted a student's name and made it yellow and recorded that as a macro, I saw the code that was written and I just copied it and pasted it in here. So the last thing I wanted to show you is a little preview of what your assignment should look like. Uh, the assignment that we're going to do this week are challenges 1, 2, and 3 on page 149. So the first question is to write a procedure that outputs a random number to the first hundred cells. Then number two says to add a statement to the procedure that will insert a formula into cell A101 that will calculate the sum of those. So I just did questions number one and two together. Used a command button again, which if you missed it earlier, it's an ActiveX control. All you have to do is go into design mode, put one of these on, uh, click it to get to the click code, and then enter your code from there. So if I click this button, it does indeed populate cells A1 through A101 with some random numbers and as you can see in 101 here we have the sum. Go ahead and take a look at the code quickly. Let's see how I did this. In this particular case I have a macro called sum 100 numbers and what I did here was record what happened when I put the formula to sum in that cell A101. So 
So I'm not going to show you all the code here, but essentially what I did to create this list of numbers was just use a for loop. Said for i equal 1 to 100, do something. That something is uh, have a variable which stores a random number. I've shown you already, and there's an example of the book on how to generate a random number. I just chose a random number between 1 and 9,999, but you can use whatever you like there. And then I use the cells dot value and set that equal to whatever the value is for cells i comma 1. That means cell 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, all the way up to 100, 1, which is row 100, column 1. After that, for question 2, I simply set cells 101, comma 1, which means row 101, column 1, dot formula equal to, and then I go ahead and put in the formula, which I know will sum those, which is equal sum A1 through A100. And for the second part of this assignment, question number three, we want to make sure that we have row one, columns one through ten populated because what we're going to do is take the values that are in row one, columns one through ten, and store them in an array. Uh, an array, as discussed in the chapter, or just like any other variable, uh, except it's a set of values instead of an individual value. So I'm going to go ahead, and this doesn't necessarily have to be uh, numbers. This could be anything because in my program when I declare the array I don't give it a data type. I just say that it's going to have 10 elements and don't specify what data type it is which means I can store any type. So I'll put some letters, I'll put some numbers, and I have 10 values there. So when I hit number 3 so I'm going to go ahead and iterate over those 10 values and store them all in an array. And what I actually did was present that message box just to make sure that the values were getting in. That's not necessary. All the question asks is for you to populate an array with those 10 values. All I did was put two different for loops. In my first for loop, I have my array i and I iterate through it 10 times for i equals 1 to i equals 10. Each time I set the value equal to whatever is in cell 1 comma i because that means row 1 and column i for i equals 1 to 10. I then iterate through again for i equals 1 to 10. Uh, the next time I loop th through my second for loop I'm just displaying a message box that shows the value of my array i. 